Hey everybody, Payments Professor here and welcome to the Payments Podium. Today we're going to have some fun talking about a hot topic and that is the topic of CBDCs, Central Bank Digital Currencies. Now, I know a lot of people, especially on my social media, get all upset when CBDC gets mentioned. And I would have to ask, first of all, do you guys know what a CBDC is? And I will tell you in, in true transparency, there are some things about a CBDC that do scare me. And there are some use cases that I would like to see and there are some that I don't want to see. But to get to learn a little bit more about CBDCs, we have Paul Thamala. Now, Paul has got his own podcast. It's called Bite Size Payments. And if you really want to learn a lot about what's happening in electronic payments, especially some of the history and some of the new stuff and what's happening in the UK, you need to go check out Bite Size Payments. Paul, welcome back to the Payments Podium. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's great to be here. I love your bow tie, by the way. I just love it. Brilliant. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, the good thing is for those listening to the podcast, we do put these on YouTube. You can check out the bow tie on YouTube. So it will be there. <laughs> All right, Paul, first question, easiest one I think I'm going to be giving you today is, well, actually, probably the most complicated one, too. <laughs> what is a CBDC? We hear this term all over the place and people are like, what exactly is it? And I hear so many different definitions. What would be your definition? I think I think we've got to think about it from a slightly different point of view, because, you know, if you think about central bank money, most people don't wake up and go, I know what central bank money is. I, you know, I, I bet even people that have listened to you for a long time don't understand that central bank money is effectively cash. Well, we've had cash since 650 BCE in Lydia, which is Turkey. And we've had you said BC, like BC. thousands and thousands of years. Exactly. So yeah, let's be honest, not much has happened in the central bank world for a long time. And we, of course, spend commercial bank money, whether that's cards or it's checks or whatever it is. That's a different thing. So we have this like digital age around us. And so central bank money doesn't really work well in a digital age. So effectively, the, um, the CBDCs are an attempt to digitalize central bank money or fiat bank money and to be able to do all the things you can do in the digital world, which of course you can't do with physical paper or coins. Um, they are managed by the central bank and they are parity by and large with a, you know, a, a pound for a pound, a dollar for a dollar, whether it's a, you know, a physical coin, a piece of paper, or it's an electronic CBDC. So it's a digital representation of central bank money or fiat money. Okay, digital representation of central bank money. Now, I got a 13-year-old named Liam, and a lot of my listeners have heard stories of him, seen the videos of him when he was even younger. And for a 13-year-old, he actually knows a lot about payments. It, it blows my mind. <laughs> and when he hears me talking about CBDCs, he says, Dad, it's real easy. It's when I log into my bank account and I see the money there. That's a CBDC. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 Liam, that's not. That just shows the what you should have as far as access to physical money. Whereas when you mention CBDC, you're actually saying that's not access to physical money. That is actually my money. It's not just a representation of, hey, I could get this in cash. It's actually saying this is what you have in the true value, which is what most people think of anyway, right? Well, that's right. And... You know, long gone has the days when they used to have, you know, lots of gold and they used to move money from one one account to the other account, like something out of a Harry Potter film or something. The, the, the truth of the matter is we haven't done that for such a long time that people just think money is money. And in truth, it's not. The only real money per se is coins and paper. Everything else is commercial bank money which ultimately goes back to real money, but it's a representation of rather than the hardcore fiat money or central bank money. Now, now can we, we clarify one thing? It's, it's only real money for anybody who's listening. It's only real money according to the laws and the regulations in, like an example, Paul is in the UK, I'm in the US. Yeah. So our physical money, it exists because of the laws and regulations we have. That's right. And actually, it starts to, I mean, part of the problem here, and, you know, you said it was the simple one, but it does tend to be the most complicated one. The real issue in many ways is 
you know, I, I jokingly talked about Lydia and, you know, 650 BCE, but we haven't touched a lot of this stuff for a long time. So we first had what paper money in 1660, I think it was. So mm -hmm. not much has changed there. So terms like, you know, legal tender, what does legal tender mean? Well, it kind of means if I rock up with some pounds or euros or dollars and it's deemed as legal tender in that currency, then you have to take it. it you know, if I, if I offer up as, as the payee, as the payer to the payee and say, right, here's $50, $50, then you have to accept it. That's now, of course, that doesn't always mean that legal tender means exactly the same thing in every country. It, it doesn't, in fact. And one of the big issues that, the, that Europe is having is every European country has a different definition of what legal tender is. But if you're now going to have a digital representation of that and you're saying you need to accept it, oh, well, you know, hold on. One, we need to get a definition of what legal tender really is. And of course, the other one is the people, the payee who's going to accept this money has to have the methodology by which they can accept it. So that's a, that's a huge and profound change that people don't think of when we talk about CBDCs. Okay, but here's the thing is, okay, if we make it electronic, I think here in the US, it is rare that I go somewhere that I can't pay, you know, electronically. So I don't know, is that different in the UK? I mean, it does happen. It does occasionally happen where I'm somewhere cash only, or I've been in a situation where the machine was down. If you got cash, you can, you know, make your purchase. Otherwise, we can't do anything right now. Well, there's a couple of things in here, aren't there? So one is, I, you know, I'll give you a couple of stats. Um, in, in, in the Netherlands, 15% of the money or the actual transactions is done with cash. However, in Bulgaria, 74% of all the transactions are in cash. So it does make a difference where you are and what you're, you know. So is that culture more than it is what's available? Yes, it definitely, definitely it is. So, you know, even in, even in Germany, people are, you know, people like checks. You know, they, you know, don't necessarily like cards as much. But, <laughs> but it's also true to say, um, you know, when you think, when we think about the acceptance of a lot of this, we should also think about it in a slightly different way. So if, you know, I live in the UK, but if I went up to the highlands of Scotland, um, there's not much internet up there. So you can be as electronic as all you like, but if I've got no means to accept it and I've got no internet, then thanks very much, but it's only cash. Um, so, you know, we have this issue with digitalization that is completely locked to the ability to have an internet wherever you are around the world. And the other side of it is also true. You may not want to take cash. You know, if you're perhaps, you know, um, uh, you know, somebody that is vulnerable, you don't want to be having that cash and you could be, you could be robbed. So you would much prefer to have this digital methodology. So a lot of the things behind the usage of cash and therefore of CBDCs are not necessarily the prima facie payments things that we want to talk about. They're a lot more mundane. They are, well, hey, there is no internet here, so I, you know, I can't accept that. And I don't want to be taking cash because I don't want to be robbed. Well, that and cash is dirty. And I, I think another thing that gets overlooked that people don't realize is cash is expensive. Yeah. To actually physically work, make, produce, move it all around. It's very expensive in comparison to a digital transaction. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's about 7%. It depends on where you are around the world. But by and large, it's about 7%. And we don't think about that. You know, when we talk about fees for this or, you know, card fees, you know, cash acceptance cost 7%. That's you and me of everything we do. So yeah, before we, before we say cash is king, we have to be careful. Right. And you know, I, I actually had a podcast here recently talking about picks in Brazil.
Yep. And they said one of the surprising things that helped it to accelerate was the cost savings from having to stock the ATMs, the cost savings from having to work and move all the cash made up for it, actually made it somewhat profitable because they weren't spending the money there. They were having the savings. But we, we're here to talk about CBDCs yep. and, yep. and what's happening in the UK. So I'm hearing about a digital euro. I'm hearing about digital options, uh, CBDCs taking place in your region of the world. Can you enlighten yeah. us a little bit more on what's happening there? Yeah, um, so the, as far as the digital euro is concerned, the, um, the EU is, is actually committed. They are saying we are going to have a digital euro. You can have your feedback, but at the end of 2023, we will have taken all the feedback. Thank you very much. We're gonna have a digital euro. The UK has a very, very similar plan, but it hasn't been specific on the actual dates, but it has talked about 2023, has talked about 2025 and putting them in place. In fact, the principles between the two are extraordinarily simple, uh, similar, sorry, but there's a couple of things behind it. Why, why would they want to do it? And I think, there, I think you could look you know, at three things. One is the dollar is by far and away the most popular currency in the world. The second one is the euro, and the third one is the pound. So effectively, there's not much pressure in, in the US to have, to have a digital dollar, but from Europe and the UK to be relevant in a digital world, it's important. So they want to be getting this stuff out. Can you elaborate on relevant in the digital world? I tell people this and they're like, what do you mean? What's, what, what's staying relevant in the digital world mean for you know, what are considered superpowers in the global economy? Yeah, well, you know, the brand of the euro being accepted around the world, yeah, is, is number two. It's about 34 um, percent. It's, 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 it's a huge amount, clearly not as much as the dollar. But let's say they didn't have a digital euro, then who would represent the digital world of payments? Well, they'd be worried that actually somebody else did. India, the US goes, thank you very much. Here's, you know, here's my scheme. So the, you know, the Euro and, and for that matter, the UK, they want to make sure that they are relevant in that world and they have tools and they can still keep that relevance in the greater scheme of payments and currencies. And I, I think there's a couple of other things here as well is, you know, crypto uh, has, has made, you know, a lot of positive and frankly, a lot of negative issues because of crashes and money's going missing. But it does, it has, it has made relevance. People are interested in it. What's, what's, the, what's the governmental world thinking about? Well, it's thinking about CBDCs. And if you like, it's a bit like the matrix. Do you want to take the red pill or do you want to take the blue pill? And you know, the governments of, 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 of Europe and the UK are saying, hey, we want to make sure we have an answer to that question. Um, and I think the other one, which is a little bit awkward, but frankly is, you know, if you're in Europe, all the other payment schemes, the, you know, the SEPA, TIPS, what have you, Target 2, they're all controlled and governed with inside the EU. Well, guess what? Networks, card networks, they're not governed inside of the EU. And the EU, and for that matter, the UK, it's exactly the same. They would like to have all payment schemes regulated and managed inside of their country. So, you know, a little bit sensitive how I said, but the, but the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of card schemes, there's a lot of card traffic. The EU and the UK would like to say, yeah, I'm in control of that too or the equivalents, and hence CBDCs could be the equivalent. Well, it, it's interesting when you talk about that regulated and managed by the government or their country. That is where I know a lot of the people who follow me online will come back and say, that's what we're afraid of. And that's where I want to come back and say, hey, I'm not saying I don't have my fears too. But the reality is you already hit on it. I look at crypto, I look at private type of networks and they have failed and people lost all their money. There was no guarantees. They weren't doing things the way they should have been doing. So by moving forward with a digital euro or, you know, digital pound, what benefits do you see by having this available, even with the government interaction being there? 
Well, I think, well, first of all, you know, it does, it does a little bit come down to, you know, do you want the blue pill or the red pill? Do you want to be inside of our chosen society or do you want to be outside of it? And if you're outside of it, then okay, that's up to you. But sooner or later, you're going to have to buy a cup of coffee and, you know, you'll have to turn that into something that you can buy the coffee with. But if you want to live in our society, whatever society that is, then you have to work within the digital world. Oh, so you have to work within the rules of that government. The truth of the matter is, though, that nearly every payment rail we have, including cards, um, except for, you know, FedNow or tips in or you know, what have you, all the other ones were built in an, in, in an analog world, 1960s, 1970s, you know. So you know, we can't turn them digital because they're an analog construct. So if you want to work in a digital world and you want to use that data and you want to have the, you know, the, the ease of the way Uber works as an example to one that people use a lot, mm -hmm. you're not going to do that with an ACH. You're not going to do that with cash. So it's really about ease and making it easy for us and to know exactly where these things are. So, you know, it wasn't that long ago as we talked about last time that, you know, a check would take 10 days and you didn't know where it were you know, where it was, where the funds were, how long it would take, you know, has somebody put it in the post? Have they not put it in the post? Well, this stuff, no, it, it, it's there. It's, it's fact. So I think it's down to the digital story and the ease that that brings and moving ourselves away from a 1950s, 1960s analog construct to one that looks like a digital world and making it easy for us as citizens. And of course for corporates too, but a lot of this is about you and me as citizens. Okay, I wanna hit on something else. I mean, you just had me have a couple of like epiphanies and ideas. Like you mentioned the analog world when that was developed. I really do wonder, what did some of the people say then, you know, as the early ACH of electronic, and I'm, I mean, before I was born days, you know, 60s, 70s, of uh, that coming along, if they weren't saying the exact same things that we're saying now about things like FedNow and CBDC going, oh no, we can't do that. That's the government taking over. Then it'll be terrible. But then we found out it worked great. I've just got this image, Kevin, of, you know, 1659, a London tavern, somebody's going, Checks are going to take over the world. You people with cash, you're all doomed. <laughs> this is going to be the tool of the future. And people go, oh, my gosh, you know what's going to happen? And I think that every time we have this step change, you know, it, it really is quite a massive one. You know, this analog to digital change. A lot of people are going to say, no, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want the state. I don't want the man to be looking after me. But as long as you're living in, you know, a society, you know, our societies have rules and we may like to change them, but the truth of the matter is they do have rules. All right. And something else that got said, too, because I hear this one a lot. Uh, and I, I may be misquoting you. I hope I don't. But it says knowing exactly where the things are. Now, that's a double edged sword in itself, because if there's a problem with the transaction, the number one thing we need to do is be able to locate it, be able to look it up, be able to figure out what went wrong so that we can correct it for the person whenever possible. But at the same time, I hear people going, this is the government knowing exactly how I'm spending my money and what I'm doing. Now, in the U.S., we, you know, monitor to a certain level to prevent, I, I know, you know, Bank Security Act type stuff. We don't want terrorism being funded, human trafficking being funded, that type of stuff. But we stop at that level. What's it like in the U.K. about, you know, that same type of fear or that level of monitoring being there? I think it's I think it's pretty much the same. You know, you, 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 you have a band of people that basically says, look, I, I believe in cash. I don't, want, I don't want the man, I don't want the government knowing what I'm doing. Um, well, except that you've probably got a mortgage and you get paid, you know, and you pay your taxes. Well, yeah, you know, all those things happen. And the other side of a lot of this, as you say, you know, it's the darker side. It's the bad things happen. It's the, it's the extortion. It's the fraud. It's the non-payment of taxes because you circumvented it. There's all those things going on. And I'm not here to judge. But what I am saying is, you know, our society has, has, has rules. And knowing where those things are, that's, that's probably, you know, a good thing for us. And, you know, I... I just, I just think sometimes we, we choose our arguments, you know, 
very, 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 very carefully. I can tell you one of the things that's happening with the with the digital euro is what a use case that will be called digital light or, you know, um, it'll be cash light, if you will. And it'll be about 3000 euros. You can hold 3000 euros of this thing and it will be effectively anonymous. So, it, you know, some of the things that you would expect over, you know, GDPR protection, they'll be there, but you won't be able to track it back to Paul Tamala. Now, that's, of course, is a very, a very simple use case and probably be won't, you know, won't be the same for everybody. Okay, we got to hit the brakes because you just blew my mind. It's something that, you know, I, I've been studying a lot of stuff and I hadn't heard that. So what you're basically telling me is that there will be levels of a digital CBDC that will be in place and some of them will be to the point where it's not traced. It's not as nearly the level of traceability or trackable that is in a higher level, which makes sense because the more money involved, the more I want to be able to trace it. Exactly. And so I'm, I'm working with SEPs, who are a think tank. Uh, in the EU, and we're writing a report back to the EU to say, thanks for your proposal, here's where we think you should change it. And then also the same with the Digital Euro Association. And, you know, one of the things is, how much is too much? Is is 3,000 euros a lot or a little? Well, that's depends, you know, what do you think about it? And then it's like, well, okay, for that use case, that's fine. But if I'm doing a multi-billion euro M&A activity, I want to know exactly who's involved. I don't want to be, uh, it's anonymous. And so, you know, if I want to go into a store, you know, you end up in a slightly different scenario. But effectively, if you're in the store and you're the retailer, you probably will incent the user either through a, you know, a loyalty scheme or a discount scheme to share that data with you. And so somewhere on that spectrum of, I want to be anonymous and I want to just give my friend 50 bucks or on a pair taxi 50 bucks all the way through the, you know, the retail experience or to a big M&A activity. You know, there are different needs and different requirements. Well, and you just pointed out something I like to point out to people, too. Your retailer wants your information much more than the government does so that they can use it to make more sales to you and you willingly give it to them. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I mean, it's not hard to do the math, right? You know, if you do something along the lines of, you know, interchange fees about 3%, 2.5%, I'm going to assume, because in the digital euro current text, it says that these effectively will be, you know, lowest. You know, there's a, there's, there is a whole methodology. But I'm, I'm expecting them to be free or neo-free from fees. So that 2.5% probably goes away. It's also true to say that most retailers will get four or five percent from a loyalty scheme. So as a retailer, you've got an eight percent swing. I'll give you one percent off. Just give me your data. Great. I mean, you know, it's a no brainer and we'd all sign up. So if I switch my cards out, I don't pay my interchange fees. I don't pay, you know, I get all the loyalty benefits. So does the retailer. I'm going to be signing up. Now, if the government says, you know, which they do, show me every transaction that you have, I might have a different relationship with that. Which they do in Europe, in, in US, not so much. <laughs> but you know, this, I mean, it's, you know, the thing about a lot of this, it comes down to, you know, who can use it? Um, how much can a person hold? How much will it be to do the fees? And who will distribute it? And a lot of these things are not done. But what I can tell you is it will be done by the end of this year. The, we'll put the feedback in, 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 in September. They will consider the feedback. They will change. They'll make a new draft. They'll take it to Parliament. And I'm expecting this to be closed and regulated. So all the proposals for the regulation to be done this calendar year. Well, I may have to get back with you in early 2024 to find out what did and didn't <laughs> happen. But another question, and it does go back to the monitoring. I, I tell people all the time in the U.S., especially, you know, we just got fed now. People like are telling me that means that they'll be able to monitor your transactions more. And I'm t explaining to them, actually, no, it's the same <laughs> that, you know, cash can even be monitored to a certain level. Your checks are monitored if they've passed through the banks or anything. Your ACH transactions we have, those are monitored, too. There, there's no higher level of monitoring. It's the same of what's already been there. 
That's, right. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, I mean, even when you talk about cash, you 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 rock up to a bank and say, "I want, I want, you know, fifty thousand dollars." They'll go, "I'm sorry, sir. Would you? Want? No." You go to India, and you you know, we had all the issues around five hundred, you know, uh, five hundred dollar bills. You know, they they stopped it. So. You know, there is there is limiting and management even of cash, either acceptance or being able to physically take it out. So everything else, it's monitored. I mean, and we want those things monitored because we want it to go to the right place and hopefully to our bank account. Yeah, I, mean, I think the same naysayers, if they were to be suddenly robbed because they had too much cash or suddenly lose, you know, a $10,000 transaction, would love that monitoring to be in place out of nowhere. You know, it's just, I, I think a lot of it's the point of view. Well, Paul, I do want to thank you for coming on. Is there any closing comments on the digital euro, what we should pay attention to other than the end of 2023 and what parliament passes? I think the big things to watch out for um, will be legal tender and how that changes our thinking. So I, I do believe that it will be um, mostly uh, forced upon people, if forced upon is the right word, but it will be you know, regulated. And I think we'll start to see changes in fees. And you know, those fees will be a lot lower than the current fees that we have. And that I think will take off the digital story. And then I think in the non too distant future, I think CBDCs will be the same as what we call cards, any other payment. And effectively, there'll be nothing else. It'll be just be payments in the future. It'll be just, yeah, I'll pay. And I won't care whether it's check, cash, blood, or love. No, it'll all be on a phone and we'll point and click and it'll be, it'll be it. So it's, I think it's, I agree. I think it's the same thing. Cause I can remember going from, you know, having my cassette tapes to my CDDs and I was so upset. I was going to have to replace everything. And then all of a sudden I had to go from CD, uh, CDs to everything digital. And I was so upset that was going to happen. And then here I am today listening to albums. You're going to have all kinds of choices that are going to be available. Some things may go away. Some things will stay, but in the long run, there's still a lot of choices and the newer options seem to be a lot better to me, at least. Now, those of you out there, listening. If you've got questions, you want to get a hold of Paul. Again, it's Bite Size Payments is his podcast. Go out there and follow him. Uh, you can get a hold of him on LinkedIn too. He's out there. If you can't get through to him, email me, Kevin at PaymentsProfessor.com. I'll make sure to get you in touch with him. And if there is a topic or a speaker you think should be on the Payments Podium, there's a forum on the Payments Professor podcast page where you can actually, it's PaymentsProfessor.com slash podcast, where you can fill out a form to have a speaker come on or a topic, or you can also just email me, Kevin at PaymentsProfessor.com. I'll make sure to get that topic covered for you or that speaker to take the podium and give their views on electronic payments. But for today, class dismissed. <music>